people have been asking what is the meaning of sovereignty this uh, the whole theme seems to be so complicated so let's just break down this complex matter into something very small imagine a tragedy has taken place in your family a loved one was crossing the road a car has hit him who is responsible for it is god responsible because he did nothing to stop it or is the devil responsible because he caused it or is the driver of the other car responsible or your loved one responsible for crossing at the wrong time or are you responsible because you didn't pray that morning questions we all have questions about everything about every situation and uh, people do ask questions about god and about the world they say if satan is called the god of this world then how can god be god and how can he have authority and so who controls the events of this world who controls the events in my life who chooses the leaders of the nations is is god able to be personally involved in my life does he fit into the sufferings of mankind why didn't he stop the world wars being god why didn't he stop 911 or the tsunami is it because the conditions were beyond his control so if they were beyond his control then is he really almighty so we understand in the present world the supremacy of god is being challenged and the creator is now being relegated to an inferior position he is banished into the background by his own creation christianity seems to be a total an abject failure an experiment that went wrong and satan seems to outwit god god has good plans but satan thwarts them even mankind seems to have the power to checkmate his maker so who really is god and how powerful is god and uh, so with this introduction we can begin to study god's sovereignty the theme of the camp is god's sovereignty and man's free will two things that supposedly are incompatible in our first session we're going to study focus on god's sovereignty now we may have many study tools and uh, we may have some personal knowledge but really if we have to understand god's sovereignty we really need the holy spirit to help us because the word of god is a spiritual book and only the holy spirit can unlock it for us so right at the beginning we want to realize how powerful god is and how puny we are and the greater the distance the better will our understanding be so let's begin with the definition sovereign what is the meaning of the word sovereign now sovereign means a person who's a supreme ruler like a king a monarch and a person who's got supreme control he's able to control all the events and he's got the power with his rank he's got the authority the right and the last point is probably the most important he is totally free 
independent, autonomous. He is free from outside control. Now this is the definition of sovereign. And by its, its definition we understand that there is no man who can be sovereign. We as human beings, we have rights, we have human rights, but we do not have absolute rights. There are limits to our freedom and there are so many limits even to the rights we have. This concept of sovereignty has been in discussion right from the time of the Romans. The, the, there is a so-called list of sovereign nations and uh, there are 206 entries there. Say, for example, the USA. When you say a nation is sovereign, it means that that nation, it has absolute control over the people in the nation. It's free from the control of other nations outside. It makes its own laws. It imposes and collects taxes, it makes war, it makes peace, it engages in trade, forms, treaties and so on. That's a sovereign nation. But really speaking, and spiritually speaking, can a nation be sovereign? Because it's not free from the control of God. And many nations are under the control of the spirits that dominate those nations. So, really, is there a nation that is sovereign? Is there a human being that is sovereign? By the definition of sovereignty, the only person who remains totally independent and sovereign is God. God alone can be sovereign. Let me read two verses from the Bible. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. God is the supreme ruler of the universe. He has absolute control over all the details of the universe, no one outranks God and he rules absolutely independent of the control of any other being. There is no other God in the world. And <clears throat> this verse tells us about his dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. This is from another version, the New American Standard Bible, and says, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? Now this is God. Now the word sovereign is not found anywhere in the King James Version of the Bible, but it is found 303 times in the Old Testament of the New International Version. And basically and simply it is this. Sovereign. God is said to be sovereign because He has the absolute right to do whatever He wants without asking permission from anyone and without needing to give an account to anyone. He is God and no one can question Him. And there are so many verses that, in the Bible that prove it. He says, I will be exalted in the earth. He is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, when we, uh, the word absolute needs to be understood. The word absolute. He has absolute sovereignty. Absolute sovereignty. You know, when we do something, we need to get counsel. God takes counsel from no one. It's according to His own counsel and according to His own will. He is totally sovereign. Now, let's understand that. 
Because he's abs he has absolute sovereignty and rule in the whole of the universe, nothing happens in this universe without his direction or permission. I like this. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing takes God by surprise. There is no criteria in this world that is above him or beyond him that can define him or determine him. He is so great. He sets up kingdoms. He overthrows empires. He determines the course of dynasties. There is no power that can control him or limit him. There is no court that can sit in judgment of him. There is no law outside of his holy nature that can bind him or direct him. He is infinite. He is infinite in power. He is infinite in knowledge. He is infinite in wisdom. He is infinite in holiness. All history is under his control and is moving towards that final judgment day. When every infraction of truth and deviation from justice will be judged. He cometh to judge the earth, with righteousness shall he judge the world, and the people with equity. So, being sovereign, being God with so much power, we must understand that there is not one tiny bit of knowledge, datum of knowledge, unknown to him. Nothing is unknown to him, because if there is one small thing that God does not know, his sovereignty breaks down at that point. If there is one person that is beyond his control, then that person will limit God's sovereignty. That's why we say, absolute sovereignty and absolute sovereignty involves absolute freedom too now this is a concept that we are not familiar with God is absolutely free means he is free to do whatever he wills to do at any time to carry out his eternal purpose and to grasp the idea of Unqualified freedom, it's not easy. Because the world that we live in is a world of bondage. And we are not psychologically conditioned to understand freedom except in its imperfect forms. We understand limited freedom. We do not know absolute freedom. We are trying to imagine freedom in a world where no freedom exists. Our freedom is limited because of our dependence on people, dependence on things. So we do not understand unlimited freedom. Sometimes we say, I want to be free as a bird. A bird outside his cage is free from the cage, but the bird is not free. Its movements are limited by gravity. It's limited to a certain place. It can't live beyond that. So in this world, we don't know what is absolute freedom. God is said to be absolutely free because no one, nothing can hinder him or compel him to stop. No one can ever challenge him and say, you can't do this or you can't do that. He's got absolute power and authority and with his absolute power and authority you know the word power and authority are both different although we use it interchangeably now for example you may have the power the strength to carry a chair here and put it into your car and take it to your house do you have the strength to do it yes you do have the strength but do you have the right to do it no that right is authority. Now God has the power and God has the authority to do whatever he wants to do. If even one stray atom of power belonged to someone else, then his power would be limited by that. God is so great, 
he doesn't need to get permission from anyone. At whose throne would he kneel? Who is higher than God for him to go and ask permission from him? Now being sovereign, there are four things about him that we need to know. His oneness. Now his oneness meaning there is no one else like him. He's unique. He is absolutely unparalleled, unequaled. He has no rival. Secondly, his self-existence, meaning no one created him. He didn't start off with the Big Bang Theory and then evolve into some superior being. He has always been God. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, from everlasting, meaning the former eternity, to everlasting, meaning the eternity to come. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So he is, there is no one like him. There is no other God who competes with him. He says, there is no God. I know not any, he says, so boldly. And self-existence, meaning he is uncreated. Self-sufficiency, meaning he is complete. He doesn't need anyone else to complete him, to sustain him or help him. He's perfect and complete in himself. And fourthly, he is the creator. Everything began from him. He never began, but everything finds its origin in him. And he is the one who possesses or has the right and control over everything. So this is what defines God in his sovereignty, his absolute right. The reason why we must know the sovereign God and understand the sovereign God is because there is another image of God being projected. Because the other God that is being preached in many pulpits and generally being understood even in Christian circles is a God who is generally weak, one whose will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose plans are thwarted, whose purpose is checkmated. And when we think of a God who is so weak, obviously when you worship Him, He is not as great as He should be in your worship. So to many people today, God is an object of pity. People are being sorry for Him more than being inspired to worship. They feel sorry for Him because... Poor God is trying his best. He's trying his best to save man. But the majority of men are not giving him the permission to save him. And that's why they're going to hell. So the will of the creator seems to be impotent. And the will of the creature seems to be omnipotent. U.S. filmmaker Woody Allen said, God is an underachiever. If he put his mind to something, he could do it. He's got the power, but not the drive. Others say, he's got the drive, but not the power. And that's why Satan is in control. Satan is defeating the purpose of God, and Satan seems to be the almighty supreme being. According to these folks, God was taken by surprise in Eden. And for the rest of planet Earth's duration, he's trying to correct that mistake. Does man really have the power to checkmate his maker? So we need to understand more about God because we really understand very little about him. So I'm just going to take you through a list of ten things about his sovereignty and these are the areas some of the areas of his sovereignty just to help us understand his sovereignty a little more he's sovereign over all mankind he's sovereign over pagan nations he's sovereign over all creation all of nature including the animal kingdom in particular he's sovereign over space he's sovereign over time He's sovereign over the angelic kingdom and he's sovereign over demons. He's sovereign over the church. 
And he's sovereign in his calling. He's sovereign over you. Now we're going to study these areas one by one to understand a little more about who our God is and how great he is. First of all, he's sovereign over all mankind. Now every human being, without exception, comes under God's sovereign control. He's sovereign over the secular governments and secular nations. He's sovereign over presidents and politicians. He's sovereign over kings and kingdoms, magistrates and emperors. He's sovereign over the decisions of presidents. He's sovereign over the laws passed in the courts. He's sovereign over every man and Therefore, by the very definition of sovereignty, because God is sovereign over every man, no man can be sovereign. So understand that. There's no man who can claim to be sovereign, having authority, the right, the power to do what he wants. So every human being is governed. He is under authority. The Bible says... The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and God turns it whithersoever he will. So when a ruler of a nation say, the lawmaker, he is engaged in foreign affairs. His will is not ultimate, it's not decisive. Let me read to you from a translation called God's Word. I'm reading Psalm 33, 10, 11. The Lord blocks the plans of the nations. He frustrates the schemes of the people of the world. The Lord's plan stands forever. And His thoughts stand firm in every generation. Some people suggest that God gave away part of His sovereignty to man. He's given away part of that sovereignty to man, and they call it free will. And therefore now man can be autonomous beyond human interference. That's not true. It's absolutely not true. Because if God has given away his sovereignty, he ceases to be sovereign. At the time of election, who chooses the leaders? Democracy. We choose, isn't it? We choose. We set up the future leader of the nation. But what does the Bible say? He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and set up, sets up kings. The Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And He gives it to whom He will. That's Daniel 2.21 and Daniel 4.17. The Most High is ruling in the kingdom of men. Can you see the sovereignty of God there? So the laws, the decisions, the decrees they make, every nation, including the decrees to persecute Christians, everything happens under God's sovereignty and they fulfill some divine purpose. But, you know, we, we have to understand, we have to obey According to God's command, we have to obey the leaders of the nations and we have to obey the laws of the nations, except when obeying these laws would make us disobey God. If we have to disobey God, then we have to be bold like Daniel and his friends. And finally, remember, God is sovereign even over you. God is sovereign over every decision you make. And not one hair of your head would fall to the ground without his knowledge. So if you realize God is so sovereign, if you realize God is so powerful, if you realize God is so great, then there will be a peace about you. There will be a calm. Every plan that you make, and everything that goes wrong in your plans. For example, I wanted the screen to be clear. That was my plan. 
So I wanted everything to be black. And it didn't happen. And it's not clear. But praise God. God, is this outside the will of God? Or did it happen in the will of God? We start thinking. If you know who God is, you will say, God, I bring everything to you. Let everything take place under your plan. And you won't be worried after that. It's when we don't understand the sovereignty of God that we get frustrated and say, Oh no, God wanted to do this and you spoiled it. This was the plan and everything has gone wrong. It's because we don't know Him. So when we make plans also, there is one important thing we must do. Maybe you understand it from this example. When Queen Victoria died, her son Edward VII was going to become king. So everything was be, being prepared for his coronation at the Westminster Abbey. Letters were being sent out throughout the world and emperors and kings and people everywhere were being invited for a very great celebration. But in all the letters that were sent around, two little letters were missing. D V Dio Volente. You write D V in your letters, right? D V. What does that mean? Dio Volente. It means God willing. God willing. Because here was a plan. Here was a plan being made by man. This coronation is going to take place in the month of April 1802. Edward was struck, stricken with appendicitis and his coronation was postponed many months. That is why whatever we do, James says, when we make a plan, today, now listen, you who may say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now that's the Bible, James chapter 4, 13 to 15. So God is sovereign over all mankind. Secondly, He is sovereign over all pagan nations, the heathen. Now throughout the history of Israel, you understand what God was doing. He was using pagan nations to fulfill his plan, which was the nation in which Israel grew and multiplied. God used a pagan nation to preserve and proliferate his people. And God used the nations of Assyria and Babylon to take them into captivity. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar was even once called God's servant. And so many things that happened in the Old Testament, he fulfilled through the nations which were against Israel, enemies. And that's the way of God. If you understand the wisdom the power and everything put together in this one word sovereignty. Even the failures of our lives. We are responsible for the failure, of course. I failed. Yes, we failed. But God is so sovereign, He can turn that failure into a blessing so great, you may get confused and think, so if I didn't fail, then this good would never have come out of it. So was it the will of God that I fail? God wanted me to fail. Then am I responsible? You see, it leads to so many questions. When nations got together and planned to do their worst, the worst that they could do, not just to man but to God, was the murder of Jesus Christ. When they got together to murder Him, did they slip out of God's control? Were they doing it out of God's sovereignty? Was it that they were doing something against God who was helpless? Let me tell you, 
at that very moment, they were totally under the control of God. At that very moment, the worst moment. Let me read from the Bible, Acts 4, 27 and 28 in the English Standard Version. Truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. They gathered together to do whatever your hand, referring to God, and your plan had predestined to take place. The heathen, the people of the world, they gathered together to do against Jesus, what you have already planned, predestined. So there is no heathen or pagan nation that can do something against God's sovereignty. Thirdly, He is sovereign in the control of creation, sovereign over nature. The Bible says, He sends His command to the earth, his word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his word and he melts them. He stirs up his breezes and the waters flow. Everything is from him. He is the God of creation and he is the God of destruction. Opposing the very first law of thermodynamics about matter and energy, saying matter can neither be created or destroyed. God created everything out of nothing. On the day of creation, He created everything out of nothing. He did not require some material in order to create. He spoke and they came. They sprang into, into existence by His word. The same God who spoke everything into existence on the day of the white throne judgment, we read everything that can be seen, every object and everything in the world and the universe will vaporize. It which simply means this, they just cease to be. They no longer exist. Matter is destroyed. It's not converted into something else. It's not converted into energy. God has absolute control over nature. Nature never disobeys Him. On the day of creation, God said, Let there be. Let there be light. Let there be. Everywhere let there be. And every time you read God saying, Let there be. What's the next thing you read? And it was so. Let there be. And it was so. He spake and it was done. So he upholds all of creation, great and small, by the power of his word. In this natural world, from the fury of the elements to the flight or the fall of a bird, it's all under his control. From raging forest fires to the crawl of a worm in the ground, that's under his control. Either from galaxies to subatomic particles, everything is within his control. All of creation. If you read the book of Jonah, the uh, book of Jonah is a book, of, uh, is a book all about creation and what happens in nature. We read about the storm, the wind, the worm, the good, and the whale. But if you read again, God commanded the great wind, God commanded the mighty tempest. God commanded a fish to swallow Jonah. God commanded the fish to vomit him. You read it there. And the, as the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded. Then God commanded a plant to grow. Then God commanded a worm and a worm to kill the plant. So everything we see, God was behind it all. While he was in the middle of a raging sea, Jesus spoke and the wind ceased. He commanded. So there is no wind, no storm, no hurricane, no cyclone, no typhoon, no monsoon, no tornado, which would not obey Him. What does that mean? It means there is no natural disaster 
or calamity outside the sovereignty of God. What does Amos 3.6 say in the Good News Bible? Does disaster strike a city unless the Lord sends it? At his command, he withholds or gives rain. He can make it rain, according to Amos. He can make it rain in one city and withhold rain from another. He may smite with plague or bless with health according to the dictates of his own infinite wisdom. After after the creation of Adam, 16 centuries went by without a drop of rain. Because God had commanded a mist to rise up from the earth to water the ground. But then when he decided and when he commanded, it began to rain. You can see his command over nature. He had absolute control over the elements during the plagues in Egypt. He had absolute control over Sodom when the fire and brimstone was destroying it. He commanded the Red Sea and the waters parted. The earth opened its mouth at his command and swallowed up the rebels of Moses. At his order, the fire did not harm Daniel and his friends. At his rebuke, the boisterous winds were calmed. At his word, the fig tree withered. The sick were cured. Diseases departed and demons were dispelled. So everything happened at his command. So he is sovereign over all of nature. It's because we understand this when we undertake a journey. Before the journey, what do we do? Before you start off on a a journey, what do you do? You pray. At the end of the journey, what do you do? You thank the driver. And thank the company which manufactured the car that took you safely. Why do you thank God? Because you are acknowledging His sovereignty over even these little things that take place. Fourthly, He's sovereign over the animal kingdom. Now God has willed that some have to be beasts of burden while others enjoy a life of freedom. Consider the donkey or the mule a life of drudgery. But you look at the lion or the tiger, they roam around like kings. Some creatures are gifted with wisdom. Some are almost totally devoid of wisdom. Some are strong, some are weak, some are beautiful, some are ugly. At his command, a donkey spoke. A whale swallowed Jonah and vomited him, as we heard. Two oxen, they went to Beth Shemesh. And they reached their destination without swerving to the left or to the right. The ravens fed Elijah. Two she-bears devoured 42 mocking youth. The lions shut their mouths and did not harm Daniel. But the same lions, they ate up his enemies. The worm destroyed a gourd. A fish swallowed a coin. The cock crew twice. Everything at his command. He has full control over the animal kingdom. He has control over space. God has complete control over space. He's named the stars. He holds them in place by his command. Man may speak of intergalactic forces and centripetal forces and centrifugal forces and so many things that holds everything in place. But the Bible says... It is God who holds everything in place by the word of his power. Lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. At his command, the sun went back ten degrees in the time of Hezekiah. At his command, a star was made to herald the birth of Jesus. And by the word of his power, he controls the movements of comets and planets. And during the tribulation period, everything happens in nature, even in outer space. When the fourth angel blows the trumpet, the sun, the moon and the stars, they're all affected. 
It's because God is sovereign at His control. And towards the end of time, He will speak. And the planet that we live on, it will burn up and it will just disappear. That will be the end of the world that we live in. Everything at His command. And then God is also sovereign over time. He is sovereign over time. There's a verse in the Bible. He says, I am Jehovah. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. This word Jehovah in the Bible, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, the better pronunciation, literally means the one who never changes. Another way of saying it, he introduced himself to Moses and the Israelites. He said, I am that I am, meaning I always I am. There was no I was or I will be. Because for God, there is no past, there is no future, but there is an unending present. Therefore, there is no before and after for God. Time was invented only for our universe, for us to live in. In this world, we have time. We have tomorrow, we have yesterday. Outside our universe, time does not exist. And it's very, very hard for us to understand this concept. If you consider a, a, a verse, a sentence that Jesus spoke, he said, Before Abraham was, can someone finish it? Grammatical error. Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. Okay, let me just, you know. Let me be the editor for a moment. Before Abraham was, I was. Does that sound correct? Why not? Before, no, I was before Abraham and I am now and I shall be. So what's wrong when saying, I was before Abraham? What's the difference of saying, before Abraham was, I am? And before Abraham was, I was. What's the difference? No, I know it's past tense and all that, but... <laughs> His name, yes, I understand that too. Time is moving. <laughs> if Jesus said, before Abraham was, I was. Another way of saying it is, I am a very, very old man. <laughs> before Abraham was, I was. That means I'm a very, very old man. But Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. If you can understand that Little verse tells you time exists only in this world. Before Abraham was, now that is our world. I am. Jesus can't say I was because when Abraham was in this world, where was Jesus? He was outside this universe. And outside this universe there is no was and will be. It is only present tense. So that's perfect grammar but we can't understand it. A simpler way of understanding. Imagine your whole life is a book. Your whole life is a book of 100 pages. And if that book were given to you, first page is your birth, the last page is your death, what would you do with the book? You'd want to flip through the pages and see how it is all going to end. Now our whole life is in God's hands as in a book and He can just flip through the pages in a few seconds, he can span the entire years of your life. God has nothing to do with time. And we can't understand it. That is why in trying to explain it, the Bible says, 
A thousand years is just like one day for him. Imagine reading a book. You're reading a book and in that book, the first page, it starts off by saying, two men were lurking in the shadows of the Ledbury camp. They were armed with machetes. And the poor campers were inside praising and worshipping. And while they were listening to session one, there was a splintering crash. Oops. (laughs) And then the unexpected happened. Dot, dot, dot. Okay? That's how it begins. You turn the next page, it says, 40 years later. With one turn of your hand, you've covered 40 years. How did you do that? If you were in the book, as a character in the book, you would have to wait 40 years. But being outside the book, the time in the book is different from your timeline. With one turn of your hand, you've covered 40 years. And God is outside the book. It's just a way of making you understand God is not controlled by time. God controls time. So all of time is under his control. He's sovereign over the angels. The Bible tells us that he does his will in the host of heaven. It is clear from scripture that all the angels are under his control. He sent an angel to Daniel. He sent an angel to Mary. He sent an angel to deliver Peter from prison. He sends his angels to reveal the future events to his servants. And when he returns, he will send angels to gather even those who offend for judgment. And he will send his angels to gather the elect. Every angel obeys his command. He is in absolute control of the angels. But this is the area of controversy. He is sovereign even over the demons. Whatever is true of the angels, they are true of the fallen angels too. The Bible says, An evil spirit was sent by God to stir up rebellion in the camp of Abimelech. That's Judges 9.23. And then in 1 Kings 22.23, we read, The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets. And again we read in the time of Saul, an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. In the New Testament, we understand from the situation about the the swine. The demons couldn't get into the swine without the express permission of Jesus. He had to give them permission. Even during the tribulation period, fallen angels will fulfill God's will. In Revelation chapter 9 verse 3, we read of an alien invasion. They are locusts. And uh, these are demonic locusts. And can you just imagine demonic locusts crawling in the face of the planet? This is what is going to happen during the tribulation period. But these creatures are given specific orders from God. He says, don't hurt the grass, don't hurt anything green, don't hurt a single tree, hurt only the men and women who lack the seal of God on their foreheads. Why do these creatures have to obey him? He commands and they do his bidding. Instead of joining Satan and his angels or even helping the Antichrist who is ruling the world at this time. So some of you may ask, why do these demons, why are they obeying God and not Satan? Then how can they be demons? Well, it's very clearly explained. These locust demons are not under Satan at all. Jesus made it obvious when he was teaching that there were fallen spirits that do not belong to Satan's kingdom. Satan is divided against Satan. Now these spirits are distinct from him, Satan and his kingdom. 
They are shut up in the bottomless pit from the time they fell. And they will be released only for the time of judgment. And they have a different king over them. His name is Apollyon, means destroyer or abaddon, meaning destruction. Now they were once holy angels, beautiful angels who were in the presence of God. But because of their rebellion and their pride and their sin, they became demons with ugly bodies. Now I did my best to disguise what they really looked like. But the Bible is not like me. The Bible doesn't spare any word in describing what they're like. And so let me just tell you what, in two versions combined, it describes what these demons look like and they will be swarming the planet. So don't be left behind to see this. These locusts looked, looked like horses ready for war. And on their heads they had crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. The sound of their wings was the sound of horse-drawn chariots charging into battle. Their tails were equipped with stings like scorpion tails. With those tails, they were ordered to torture the human race for five months. They were ordered to torture, but not to kill. Torture them for five months. With the sting of a scorpion. Now, they have the venom of scorpions. And we know there are about, well, over a thousand species of scorpions. And a scorpion's venom cannot kill. It can cause a lot of pain. And the most danger of, uh, dangerous of the scorpions is scorpions call, call the death stalker. Another name for death stalker is the Israeli desert scorpion. Now, it's... Venom is a powerful cocktail of neurotoxins and five months, torture them for five months. Now that's the lifespan of a scorpion. And it takes about two months to heal. Revelation 9, 5 and 6 says, when this happens, people are going to prefer death to torture. They look for ways to kill themselves, but they won't find a way because even death will have gone into hiding. Then again the Bible tells us in Revelation about four angels who are bound near the river Euphrates. Now this river Euphrates is 1,780 miles long and it is the longest and the most important river in Western Asia. And there are four angels. Now I say they are demons because they are bound and God doesn't bind his angels. These angels are bound there and they will be released only for the future war, for the battlefield. And these angels will have running after them 200 million riders on horses with breastplates that were fiery red, hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow. All this is what is going to happen during the tribulation period. But everything at his command. Why? Satan himself. Satan is totally under God's sovereignty. He is not a fallen angel let loose and Outside God's sovereignty. God could take him away, but he does not. His sovereignty permits Satan to be there for some purpose that is fully understood by him. And although he remains, Satan is absolutely subject to God's control. Take, for example, the incident in the Garden of Eden. When he was indicted in that garden for deceiving man, he listened to the awful sentence passed on him by God, but he could not answer a word. Even man answered. He couldn't answer. He was unable to touch Job without God's permission. And he could not sift Peter without Jesus' permission. And when Jesus commanded him to depart after his temptation, he had to depart. And on the final day of judgment, when he is being cast into the lake of fire, he cannot refuse. He will have to go. Ninthly, the Lord is fully in sovereign control over the church. The church is not a building. The church is Christ's body. And is full of Him. Now, if you consider your own body, which is the part of the body which is right on top? The head. God has put his head on the top 
so that no other member in the body might be above the head. Now think of your body for a moment. Why do we not have a problem between two members in our body? Have you ever heard a complaint from a believer? I'm having a problem during the worship. If, if, if any problem during the worship, people say, Oh, the music is too soft, or the music is too loud, or I can't hear, my voice is not being heard. Those are the complaints. Have you ever heard a man saying, Please pray for me because during worship my right hand is trying to clap but my left hand refuses to cooperate. How is it that when you try to clap and you're singing, clap your hands and how is it that they both meet correctly? Have you ever had a problem putting your leg into a shoe? Of course, you do find sometimes the shoe goes small because these shoes are really bad these days. But have you ever had a problem saying, I'm trying to put my foot in, but my foot refuses? Why is it there's such perfect harmony in your body? Because no member in your body has a brain, has a mind of its own. Every member is being commanded by the head, the brain. The head thinks, say for example you're walking and your foot strikes against a stone. What do you instantly feel? Pain. First thing you feel is pain. Do you know that even that pain is because the brain commanded? The message is sent to the brain saying the foot has struck a stone. The brain will send the reply saying feel the pain. Then the brain commands the hand saying Go. And the back says, I can't bend. (laughs) And the brain says, all right, if you can't bend, if someone's or something's in your way, then sit down. It's the brain that commands. It's everything by the brain, by the head. Now that's the human body. And God in His wisdom has said that the church is a body. Christ is the head and we are His members. In other words, What relationship your members have with your head in your body, that's the relationship we as the members of Christ have with Christ. He is so much above us. Pascal says, to be a member of a body is to have neither life, nor being, nor movement, except through the spirit of the body and for the body. So we are, everything we do is directed by the head and there is no self. So being in the church Being in Christ's body is a beautiful way to practice selflessness, to allow Christ's sovereignty to rule. And finally, He's sovereign in His calling or our calling. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He says... It's all my decision. I will show mercy to anyone. I will call anyone. And it's, it's his decision. Why is that person called and why am I not called? And you will see the, the wisdom of God in so many little, little things. Ishmael, the firstborn, was rejected. And Isaac was made the child of promise. Esau was rejected. Jacob was chosen. Saul was rejected. David. And there's a long list where you see how God chooses and what God does. The nation that God singled out to be the depository of His holy oracles were not the ancient Egyptians. They were not the civilized Greeks or the imposing Babylonians. But they were a totally unknown, despised, nomadic Hebrews. And God chose them. He is sovereign in every choice and His calling for people. And His calling to be in a place. A little example from my own experience. Now, um, when I was in India, I was uh, in my training period in the first year. My brother also was there. And... um, 
we both loved to interpret from Tamil to English. And there was a particular pastor there called Pastor M.T. Thomas. I don't know, some of you may know him. And he used to go around from place to place giving his Daniel Bible studies. And, and I used to like it, traveling around with him, not just for the Bible studies, but then we get some good food after that. <laughs> so um, we used to travel around. And uh, so my brother had a turn, then I had a turn. It so happened one particular week when it was my turn, I was given some other duty. And it was my turn to go. And I was told that you have a duty to do. So you can't go. So who stopped me? Was it man or was it God? Shall I start session one again? <laughs> but I didn't say it is God. I felt so frustrated. I was so unhappy. Why did this happen? So the next week I thought, okay, I lost my turn this week. So the following week will be my turn. And I was told, no, that is his turn. So your brother has to go. I said, that's two weeks continuously. It's not fair. Who's doing this to me? Are you sure it's God? These things happen in your own home. It's not fair. It's not fair. What about him? What about him? Justice and injustice. When I was small, I was so rebellious at home. When four of us finished eating, my mom would ask me, bring the plates, you know, to the, to the kitchen sink. I would bring two. She said, where are the other two? Why don't you ask him? 50-50. <laughs> Be fair. Justice. And then what happened the following week? I wasn't able to go to interpret again. Because I wasn't well. Whose fault is that? Who's doing this to me? You worship a cruel God. Why do you blame him for all these little things? In the end, seven continuous weeks, I didn't interpret. Who did that? And then what happened? Pastor M.T. Thomas, he got used to my brother's interpretation. And the following week, he asked permission from the chief pastor, can I take Brother Teju? It was my turn. <laughs> pastor Thomas, now what are you doing? It is God's sovereign will that I must be your interpreter. <laughs> and you have just broken down God's sovereignty. And you've taken away a theme for our camp. Whose decision was that? And this went on and finally 30 Bible studies. Everything was, my brother was the interpreter, not me. I was so upset. I wanted a chance and I used to get, we used to have a little, you know, spats here and there. Like say a pastor's car is parked outside his room. It means pastor is on a visit. And I would just be coming from washing and I would see my brother loitering in the area. I said, what are you standing here for? <laughs> you can see the car here as he's about to go for a visit. You're hanging around here so that he can call you, isn't it? I was so upset with him. Was he doing something outside the will of God? Well, in his little world, well, you can ask him. As far as God is concerned, nothing can happen outside his sovereignty. God controls that situation. In the end, I stopped interpreting completely. And he was traveling everywhere with pastor. Who did that to me? Was it God? Why did you do that? Why did you let it happen? Finally, a year and a half after our training together, the leaders made a decision to transfer my brother to the UK. And when the decision was made... The chief pastor spoke, Pastor M.T. spoke, and they were told in the discussion, Brother Teju is a very, very useful interpreter in India. So why cannot Brother Rohit be sent to the UK instead? <laughs> now, who did that? <laughs> did I plan that event to take place? 
Did I plan that it should happen like that? No. We say all things work out for good. You take all the negative things positively, it, work, it works out for good. But that's not the real story that I'm going to say. I'm going to go back to my childhood. Man plans, man does so many things. But if you go back to when I was, say, 17, 18 years, my brother was 20 years, we both had our own rooms, and we both had desks, and we both had 10 dictionaries. My table was full of Chambers and Webster and Oxford and you have Daniel Jones received pronunciation. You have all these dictionaries on my desk. On his desk, you have Tamil, Hindi, Malayalam, Telugu. Who is in control? Today, he is a very, very useful interpreter and he preaches in Tamil. He goes around to different places interpreting. Did, God, did he know that he is going to be in India and he's going to serve? Did I know I'm going to be in the UK and I would need you know, some English to speak a few words to people who would need to understand what I'm trying to say? But God, he plans everything. The place where you should be. Every one of you who's married, look at your wife, look at your husband and say, you were planned by God for me. Because so many people after they get married, they say, I made a big mistake. <laughs> One father introduced his son to me and he said, this is my only mistake. <laughs> Do we have, are we sovereign? Remember, Everything that happens. If you understand who God is and how powerful He is, you will surrender and say, God, have your way in my life. We sing songs, Lord, have your way, but we don't realize the value of those words. Lord, I do not want to rebel against your sovereignty. I humble myself. You are great. And even in the calling upon my life. And the salvation of a soul that's the matter of God's sovereignty. The salvation of an unbeliever, it does not depend on how perfect my presentation is. It does not matter how well I evangelize and how clever my arguments were. The salvation of an individual is totally by the grace of God. So, the conclusion is this. God's sovereignty is probably the most comforting of all God's attributes. That God is in total control, not only of the good things, but even the bad things in life. He is in control when you go through severe trials. When you think God has forsaken me, no, He is in control. And that truly relieves us. Charles Spurgeon, the London pastor from 100 years ago, he said, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit, as well as the sun in the heavens, that the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars in their courses. The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is as much fixed as the march of the devastating pestilence. The fall of leaves from a poplar is as fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. Everything is in God's control. So to say He is sovereign, therefore we are saying, God does as He pleases, only as He pleases, always as He pleases, and that whatever takes place in time is but the outworking of what He has decreed. Isaiah 14.27 says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, who shall dishonor it? And His hand is stretched out, who shall turn it back? Such is the sovereignty, such is the power of God. Now I'm going to tell you something. This is what Lucifer wanted. 
He wanted to be like God. He wanted the sovereignty. He wanted to be equal with God. He wanted autonomy. I want to be capable of making decisions without God's interference. Could Lucifer be sovereign? Why not? Please, at the end of the session, give me the right answer. Why cannot Lucifer be sovereign? Because an angel, so why can't an angel be sovereign? Only one can be sovereign. There cannot be two sovereigns. Two sovereigns cannot exist. The people of the world, they hate the doctrine of God's sovereignty. They do not want to be under God's sovereign rule, but they cannot take it away from Him. So let's understand that the Lord God omnipotent reigns. His government is exercised over inanimate matter, over the brute beasts, over the children of men, over angels, good and evil, over Satan himself. And no revolving world, no shining of star, no storm, no creatures' movements, no actions of men, no errands of angels, no deeds of the devil, no trial, no temptation, no persecution. Nothing in this entire vast universe can come to pass apart from His sovereignty. Here, therefore, is the foundation of our faith. This is a resting place for our troubled minds and this is the anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast. So let me state this before I finish. It is not blind fate or unbridled evil or man or the devil, but the Lord Almighty who is ruling the world, ruling it according to His sovereign pleasure and for His own eternal glory. Just before I finish, let me give you a little sneak peek into something else because i know some of you are just waiting to go and write a question there so if god is fully in control does he know what i'm about to do i'm going to miss session two did god plan that i should do it i've decided to leave the upc is it god's will it's not God's will. So I'm able to do something which is not God's will. I'm, am I breaking the sovereignty of God? Does God know? Well, this happened in my college. Someone came up to me and asked me. Does God know where you will be in eternity? I said, of course. He knows it. He already knows where you're going to be. I said, yes. So he said, why don't you freak out? I asked, what do you mean? He said, he already knows it. And you can't change it. So why do you have to pray for it to happen? And why should you avoid sin for it not to happen? Why, why do you worry? It's going to happen anyway. So enjoy life. So if I enjoy life and I go away from His will, can I go to hell? If God has already decided that I should be in heaven, how can I change what He has decided? Session two is God's sovereignty, man's free will. If man has free will, and God has no way he can know our future, if man has free will, and there is no way for God to touch it because it's free will, right? How can God be sovereign? You are a proof that God's sovereignty breaks down, aren't you? How can these two coexist? If you knew the raging controversy in Christendom for the last 2,000 years because of this. But I don't want to say too much. So let's come back for session two to understand God's sovereignty and man's free will. Shall we stand?